All right, welcome back to Calculus 3. Uh, so today we're going to continue our quest to establish these uh, higher dimensional analogs of the fundamental theorem of calculus. And today we're going to continue doing that through learning about something called uh, Green's theorem. Now, for today in particular, this can be, um, you have to think kind of carefully about this stuff. So I want you guys to pay like especially close attention today. Like this is one of the ones we have to like really focus on the details for it to make any sense. So I'm buckle up and get ready for this one. All right, so let's talk about what Green's theorem is here. Green's theorem relates a line integral around a simply closed uh, plane curve C. So remember what that means. It means that something like this is okay. Something like that is, is not okay right here. Um, the boundary curve of D is donated by um, this little partial symbol D. And it is positively oriented if we walk along the curve in the direction of orientation, region D is always on our left. So let's say we have some kind of region like this, and the shaded region is D. So it'll be positively oriented if we're going this way. So if we're going counterclockwise around it, because at any time as we're going along our path, if we're in the perspective of this arrow, the, D, uh, the domain D will always be to our left here. So this would be positively oriented. And then, as you might imagine, we could also have negatively oriented where the region D is always on your right going around like this. So this one would be considered negatively oriented. Um, the reason why this is going to be important, so you guys remember in Calc 1 way back when, um, how you could flip the order of integration if you gained a negative sign? That's essentially what's going to go on here. If you follow the path in the opposite direction, we're going to end up getting a negative sign in our integral. And that would be uh, crucial coming up later. So that's why this orientation matters. Okay, so let's get to the theorem here. Let's see be a piecewise smooth, simple closed curve, positively oriented, in the plane, and let D be the region bounded by C. So it's the boundary of D here. Let F be a vector field whose component functions have continuous first partial derivatives on D. Then, um, so if we expect this to be a fundamental theorem of calculus, then there should be some kind of derivative and integral interacting and, and canceling out. So the way that's going to manifest here is we're gonna have a double integral and then we're gonna have partial derivatives in here. And this is gonna be over the region D. So what we have is a double integral and we have these derivatives here and you can imagine that they cancel out to this single integral right here. All right, so this is, uh, this is Green's theorem right here. Now you might be wondering, okay, where does this weird function kind of come from? What, where, where does this come from? Uh, unfortunately, the answer to that we'll have to wait for a future class when we can see in more detail where this formula specifically comes from. Although one thing I'd like you guys to notice now is that these are the cross partials of P and Q right here. So remember P is in the X coordinate, Q is in the Y coordinate, but we're doing the derivative of Q with respect to X and the derivative of P with respect to Y. So we have the cross partials being subtracted here. This only works with 2D. We're gonna learn a, a theorem that's similar to this that will work in 3D uh, in a future lesson. So, but for now, we're just gonna focus on, um, on 2D right here. All right, Blue's theorem. <laughs> yeah, this is the only color uh, theorem name we have. All right, so yeah, so as we were saying, Green's theorem can only be used for a 2D vector field, but we will get a generalization of this. And when we see the generalization, then it will be obvious uh, where this ends up coming from right here. All right. And then what does Green's theorem apply for a conservative vector field uh, with the circulation around a closed path? Well, remember for a conservative vector field, so let's say we're doing f dot dr, by Green's theorem, this is the same thing as going over the interior of this curve. And we have partial Q partial X minus partial P partial Y. Now with conservative vector fields, we know one thing is true. We know that the cross partials need to be equal. So if these guys are equal and we're subtracting them, well, that's just a fancy way of saying zero. And I don't care what domain we're going over, this is gonna end up being zero. So as we expect, conservative vector fields are again very nice. We end up getting just zero from this integral right here. 
Okay, now the next part's a little bit tricky. So um, previously, we this this theorem initially only kind of applies to regions that look like this. You know, kind of uh, simply uh, simple regions right here. But we can also extend Green's theorem to hold for non-simply connected regions as well. So what I'm saying is that we can potentially have something that looks maybe like a donut. Uh, which way would be the, yeah, there we go. So Green's theorem will also end up working uh, for something like this as well. So let's call this outer curve C1, and then let's call this inner curve uh, C2. And then D will be the area here. How can we get away with doing this? Because it says in the theorem that we can only use uh, things like this. Why can we, um, why can we just do this right here? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna redraw the same region. Oops, well, I'm gonna to attempt to redraw the same region. Um, but I'm going to break it up into, into several pieces here. So here's the inner donut hole, and it's kind of connected through these very thin kind of ways in and out here. Now, it has the same orientation. So this curve's still going this way. This one's still going this way. And you have this as well. Um, but what's happening is I actually split this into two pieces. There's D1 up here, and then there's D2 down here. And this curve um, up here is going around with a positively oriented way around D1. So we would have arrows like this. And then there's also the positively oriented curve that's going around D2. And we have arrows like this right here. So anyways, if we want to do the line integral, or sorry, the double integral over QX minus PYDA, so we want to do this for the entire region D right here. Well, we can split up the double integral to be just over these two pieces. So we have the part that's over D1, and then we have the part that's over D2. Okay, and that that this this equation makes sense because we're just doing the double integral over this half, and then we're doing it over this half and just adding the results together. So that's okay. Um, but now what we can do is we can use Green's theorem on each one of these individually, because this right here, if we kind of look at this lower shape right here, this like upside down C shape, uh, this, is, this satisfies the conditions of our previous theorem. It looks something like this right here. I don't understand how to tell if positively oriented or negative. You just follow along in the path that it's going. And if you imagine that you are the arrowhead here, the region shall always be to your left. And yeah, that's another way of doing it. Uh, positively oriented in general is like counterclockwise. Okay, so we can use, um, yeah, so we can use Green's theorem right here. And I'm gonna call this uh, C prime one and C prime two. So if we flip these into Green's theorem mode, and we switch them with our line integrals here. So we use Green's theorem on each one of these individually. Then notice what happens. So we have, we're integrating, or maybe I should write this as, uh, I should write this as PDX plus QDY. That's a little bit more obvious. All right, so what's going on here is that we use Green's theorem on each one of these integrals individually. But the thing is, is that when we're integrating along this path, on these little joints right here, we're going to the right for C1 prime, and then we're going over the same integral, just we're going in the opposite way to the left right here for D2. And then the same thing happens for this region right here. So when we do these integrals, we do the integral of the same function. These are both the same function. Look at, look at that, they're the same function. We're doing this one way, and then we do it the opposite way. Those parts will cancel out. So whatever's going on with these little connections here, those will cancel out. And what will end up being remaining is we have this half of um, 
C1, and then we have its other half down here. And then we have this half of C2 and its other half down here. So what do we have? We end up having this right here. It's just that we needed to write it as broken up into these two pieces here. So this ends just up, this ends up being uh, PDX of C1 plus QDY plus the integral of C2 without primes, PDX plus Q dy right here. So this is just a little bit of a justification as to we could do this with regions with holes as well. And the way we do that is we just add together the line integral that we would get from this part to the line integral that we would get from our inner part here. This might seem kind of like a weird, like, okay, this is kind of just a special case, but this is gonna help us do a very difficult problem uh, later on. Is this the same as taking the integral of the same function over different bounds? Um, it has, yeah, it does have to do with that. So this is like saying back in calc one, these canceling out is like saying that the integral from zero to one is the negative of the integral from one to zero. We're essentially doing this in calc three mode. And that's why these little intermediate parts canceled out. And we were able to just get the main curves that we had earlier. But pretty much uh, the moral of the story is we could use Green's theorem on donuts too. We just have to add up the line integral for this and the line integral for that. Okay, enough theory here. Let's actually go ahead and do this and see how this works. Evaluate the line integral using Green's theorem. All right, so if we chose not to use Green's theorem here, we would have to integrate things like e to the negative x squared. Uh, and I don't really want to do that, or it's not so much that I don't want to do that, it's that I can't do that. So what we're going to do is we're going to turn this into a double integral using Green's theorem here. So I'm gonna consider this my P. This is my X component right here. And then we have Q, which is the Y component of my vector field here. Now remember what Green's theorem says. If we have the line integral, let's see, it doesn't go up there, of PDX plus QDY, this is the double integral over the region that this bounds. So this is gonna be our D here of the partial derivative of Q with respect to X minus the partial derivative of V with respect to Y. Now it seems kind of odd that we're taking a single integral and turning it into a double integral given our experience with how difficult multiple integration can be. But trust me, doing this will actually make things work out pretty well. Okay, well, let's set up what this double integral is gonna be. Let's do the partial derivative of Q with respect to X. So the partial derivative of Q with respect to X is just gonna be three X squared. Okay, we subtract. And then we do the partial derivative of P, so this, with respect to Y right here. So we bring down the two here and then we have two X Y. And that's it. Now we just need to integrate this over this domain. And I don't know about you, but I would much rather do this double integral than this single integral right here. So we transform this pretty much impossible line integral into an easier double integral. Now we do need to set up the double integral. So we need to dig deep and remember how that works uh, back here. Why does subtracting convert it to um, D? Um, I think you're effectively asking for like a justification as to why this works. Uh, this is something that we're gonna kind of have to take for granted right now. And then I'll be able to give you the full story in a lesson or two. So we'll just, you're just gonna have to bear with me and just kind of accept Green's theorem as a, as a fact for now. And then you'll kind of see where it comes from uh, later here. All right, so let's go ahead and do this double integral. I think I'm gonna do the Y integral first. Okay, so my lower bound for y is this, y equals zero. And then my upper bound for this, well, let's see, I go from the origin to two, two, that kind of seems like y equals x for this line. So my y will go from zero to x right here. And then it seems like my x value started zero and then to two. All right, and then now we just have a simple polynomial integral. Uh, let's see, this is 3x squared y minus xy squared from zero to x. All right, I plug all of that in. So 
This is 3x cubed minus x cubed. All right, well, this is another way of saying 2x cubed. And if I do the power rule on that, then I raise this to be four and then divide by four. So I have one half x to the fourth from zero to two. Two to the fourth is 16, but then I divide by two and get eight here. So rather than doing this impossible line integral, which wanted me to go all the way around like this, I instead did an easier double integral. Does C having a direction have anything to do with the problem? Yes, in order to use Green's theorem, we need to make sure it's a positively oriented curve. So if we kind of look at the direction these little arrows are going, we see that in the direction of the arrows, this D is always to the left, like we have it to the left here. If we're looking in the same direction as this arrow, D will be to our left here, and we can verify the same for that. So because this was positively oriented, we were allowed uh, to use Green's theorem. All right, what exactly does this area represent? Um, again, that's something I'm gonna have to push back until later, um, but as we'll see later on in the class, we can actually engineer this to represent any kind of uh, double integral that we want. Arrows are provided. Um, yeah, they'll usually either provide you a picture or tell you which ways the arrows go. Like in this next problem. All right, let's do another one where we convert a uh, more difficult um, single integral into an easier double integral. So evaluate this, where C is the boundary oriented counterclockwise of the region determined by Y is root four minus X squared and Y is zero. So we're going counterclockwise, meaning we're going this way right here. Okay, well, we have a positively oriented surface and we can check all this uh, domain D is going to be to the left of all of our arrows right here. All right. So what we want to do here is we want to convert this using Green's theorem. So I'm going to call this P. I'm going to call this Q. And now I'm going to look at my double integral and see if that gets any easier. So remember, my formula is Q sub X minus P sub Y. That's going to be my new integral right here. All right. Um, oh, here's a good question. Uh, would it be a negative integral if it was negatively oriented? That's right. Yeah, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. I'll show you an example of how that's going to work. But yeah, you're right about that. All right. So we have Q sub X. So let's see. Q sub X is just 6X squared. Okay. And then we subtract, and then we have P sub Y, which is 6Y squared. Okay, so this is the double integral that we need to do here. All right, now let's see here. Um, we're doing this around a half circle, right? So that kind of gives me the idea that maybe we should um, use polar coordinates here. That seems like a good idea to me. So let's try to use polar. So if we use polar, this will be six R squared cosine squared of theta minus six R squared sine squared of theta times R dr d theta. And since we just have a basic half circle here, our bounds will be easy. Our R will go from zero to two. And then our theta will go from zero all the way to pi. All right, so we just have to do this integral. And this, this doesn't look, super great, but maybe we can make it better. Okay, I can factor out an R and then the six R squared making a six R cubed right here. And then I have cosine squared minus sine squared remaining. Okay, now I think we used this uh, last class here. Uh, yeah, Tristan has the right idea here. Uh, we're gonna use cosine of two theta to make this easier. That's what this is equal to. And thankfully, since we have constant bounds and a function that can split over multiplication here, that means that we could do this double integral via the multiplication trick. So this is gonna be from zero to two, six R cubed dr. And then that's gonna be multiplied by the integral from zero to pi of cosine of two theta d theta right here. All right, so let's see here. Let's do this one. 
So if I integrate cosine of two theta, I have sine of two theta over two from zero to pi. All right, and then I'm gonna go ahead and plug pi in here. I have sine of two pi, which is zero. I'm gonna plug zero in here, sine of zero is zero. And would you look at that? This is gonna equal zero. So I don't even care what that is anymore. This is just gonna end up being zero. I think I saw some people taking bets in the chat earlier if one of these integrals is gonna be zero. So if you bet on this one, then you, then you win here. It's gonna end up being uh, zero. Is this a conservative vector field? Interesting, it's not. So if we look at, uh, yeah, because if it was a conservative vector field, then we just would have gotten zero for this right here. So if, if the cross partials would have equally each other, it would have been conservative and it would be zero right there. Um, so this goes to show you that just because we get a closed curve giving us zero does not necessarily imply that the vector field that we were going over um, is going to be conservative. So the reasoning doesn't go the other way. Okay, this is where the rubber hits the road here. We're gonna have to really focus on this next example. This one's gonna be a little bit tricky. Okay, now this one might, might look familiar. This was the problem from the if time permits uh, last class right here. So we wanna do the, um, the line integral of negative y over x squared plus y squared dx and x over x squared plus y squared dy. And we're gonna do two different situations here. So the first one is C is gonna be any piecewise smooth, simple closed curve not containing the origin in its interior. All right, what is all that saying? <laughs> That's actually a lot. It means that if the origin is right here, it could be any kind of curve like this. So it could be this one, or maybe it can kind of be like this. Just any kind of simple closed curve and it doesn't have the origin. In it. All right. Now, what was the big deal with this last time? Well, the big deal last time is that the domain did not include the origin. And I kind of briefly went over how that ended up being a problem. If you integrated one way around the origin, I think you ended up getting a lot of pi. And if you integrate the other way around the origin, you end up getting negative pi. So this kind of messed up our nice conservative phenomenon because of the um, omitting the origin here. Okay, but we could actually kind of use that here. Notice that these curves don't include the origin at all. So that means that we're totally within the domain of this function. Now, if we do partial derivatives, and I think they just kind of gave us this, we don't need to show this, that the cross partial property actually works here. So if we use Green's theorem, and we take this as our P, and this as our Q, and use Green's theorem, then when we're integrating over D here, and notice that D is not going to include the origin in any case, because it doesn't contain the origin, uh, we're gonna look at Q sub X minus P sub Y right here. All right, but we just said that these are equal in the domain of F, and we are in the domain of F because we don't include the origin. That's the only potential problem here. So these are the same. So this is a hard zero. So we're integrating zero and we get zero. So what this is saying is that if we remove the origin, then there's absolutely nothing wrong with this curve. It is gonna be conservative if we don't really consider the origin right here. So if as long as our curve doesn't go around the origin, then we are okay. All right, well then I bet you could probably guess what's gonna happen next. Uh, what if we decide to violate this rule? What if we decide to actually go around the origin or have a curve include the origin. Uh, so for this part, um, we're having curve C be the curve X to the two thirds plus Y to the two thirds equals one with counterclockwise orientation. So we're following along this guy right here. So it's kind of this circle that's been had his edges pushed in like this. Okay, now technically we could attempt to do just the line integral without having to use Green's theorem. But the way we would parameterize this would be X is cosine cubed of T, cubed, not squared. Y is sine cubed of T. And I tried to do this integral for fun earlier with um, uh, using this right here, and it's not pretty. It, it ends up being something really awful. Uh, so we can't 
or it can't, or at least it's difficult to do this directly. So we want to use Green's theorem somehow. But the problem is, is that we have this pesky little point in the middle. We can't just do the same thing that we did last problem because these aren't even defined for the point that we include in here. So we can't just use the same reasoning that got us that nice zero here before. All right, so what are we supposed to do? Well, what I'm gonna do is something that seems a little bit strange, but bear with me for a second. What I'm going to do is I'm gonna draw another curve. It's gonna be a circle of small radius, which I guess I'll call A, around the origin. And if I draw my arrow this way, um, yeah, if I draw my arrow this way, and this is my region right here, what's the orientation of this little circle curve? Is it positive or negative? Ooh, we got some heated debate here. Positive, negative, positive. 50-50 chance. Um, so remember the domain here is gonna be in between these. So it's gonna be in between this weird kind of star looking thing and it's gonna be outside of the circle. So if we look and see, if we follow this arrow and we look to see which side our domain is on, it's actually gonna be on the right side. So this is going to be a negative orientation right here. So this curve in the inside is oriented negatively. So that's actually gonna um, make a difference in what we're doing. Okay, now since I've drawn two curves, and this time I have something that's kind of like a donut. So I have my outer curve and then I have my little inner curve making a circle in the middle. That means I can use my result way back from the beginning of class. So I can use this result right here saying that I could use Green's theorem on non-simply connected regions. So I don't know how it works with just a point remove, but I do know how it works with this kind of pointy donut right here. All right, actually, I wanna, I wanna stop and make sure everyone's with me here. Does everyone, do, do you guys want me to explain again why this is negatively oriented? Okay, so let me kind of blow this picture up a little bit. So let me make the circle bigger. This shaded area is the domain D. If I'm, oops, let me include the picture, there we go. Um, so if you look at which way I'm going, so like if you imagine that we are on this arrow, where is the domain D? It's gonna to be to the right of my arrow here. If it were to the left, we would be considered positively oriented, but since the domain, the stuff we care about is to the right, we are considered negatively oriented, which is why we don't use the terms clockwise and counterclockwise. We use positively and negatively oriented because this is going counterclockwise, but according to this domain here, relative to this domain, it's going to be negatively oriented. Why do we make it up that way? Uh, you'll see in a second. We're gonna use a kind of an interesting trick to do this problem. All right, so let's see here. So let's write out our function that we wanna integrate. We wanna do this line integral here. All right. Now we're doing this along both this outer curve, which I'm gonna call C1, and then this inner curve, which I'm gonna call C2. So the outer star-shaped curve will be C1, and the inner circle will be C2. All right, so let's see here. Um, so if I add what I get from C1, and then I add the negative of C2 going in the reverse direction for that, then I'm gonna get the double integral over D of P dx, or sorry, partial Q, partial X, and then partial P, partial Y. Okay. Um, so let, let me kind of reevaluate what I have here. So if I wanna go over this region D, remember I just add the two curves together. I have the outer curve and I have the inner curve. And why did I put a negative for this one? Well, by default, C2, we said, was negatively oriented, right? So I need to go the other way around C2, the opposite direction of my 
orientation in order for it to be positively oriented right here. Um, so I need to go the other way for Green's theorem to work. All right, now let's see here. Notice that D does not contain the origin. And we saw what happened last time D didn't contain the origin, right? We're gonna end up with zero for this. Why'd I give the inner circle that entration? Patience, you'll see, you'll see in a moment here. Uh, so since we don't include the origin here, we have qx minus py equaling zero because we don't need to worry about uh, dividing by zero with our x squared plus y squared right there. All right. So we're just doing the double integral of zero dA, which is zero. But that's not our answer. Remember, our goal is to figure out what this is. Remember, this is our goal. Because C1 is actually this, this curve that we care about. C2, we just made up and we, they didn't ask us to do this anymore. So we're trying to figure out what this is. So what we're going to do now, now that we have the integral of C1 plus negative the integral of C2 equaling zero, what we're going to do is we're going to reverse the direction that we're going around C2 right here. So my next equation, so I have my original C1, and remember I'm just trying to figure out what this is. All right, and then I'm going to spit this negative up here. So this is what I was saying in the beginning of class. You can go around the other direction, but in order to do so, you need to negate your integral. All right, so we all have all that. And remember, the sum of these is still zero. All I did between here and here is I changed uh, which direction I was going around C2, my inner circle. And since I'm going around in the negatively oriented way now, I gain a negative sign right here. What's that circle thing? This is a smudge. Yeah, sorry about that. All right. But I have negative of this integral, so I could add it over here. So I have the, my integral around C1, and I'm going to write a squiggle for all this because I'm tired of writing it. So I have my integral around C1, and if I add this over, it's going to be positive, the integral around C2. So this is really what I was trying to get at here. My integral going around C1 this way is exactly the same as if I went around my integral this way, following C2. Now, why does that matter? Well, in order to follow the outside path, I need to parameterize things like this and I did this earlier and uh, it's not fun, but rather instead what we could do is we could go around C2. And C2 just has the parameterization, X is A cosine of T, Y is A sine of T, where A is some small number. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the C2 integral instead. I'm gonna do the C2 integral instead. And whatever I get for that, will be my C1 integral, which was my goal. That's what all this maneuvering here did. Yeah, I'm gonna go over this again. Yeah, this is why I told you guys to buckle up. This one's, this one's kind of rough. So what I did, the first thing I did in this problem, I drew this negatively oriented circle around the origin. It's negatively oriented because the area is to the right of it. Now by Green's theorem, uh, and it, by Green's theorem working for, for donut shaped things like we did earlier, um, as long as I go around all the curves that are its boundary, so I go around C1, and I go around the opposite direction of C2, so it's positively oriented, because remember, it needs to be positively oriented for this to work, then I can replace these single integrals with double integrals of Qx minus Py. But because we don't include the origin right here, remember, we don't include the origin, remember what happened last time we didn't include the origin for this function. In that case, PY is going to be QX. So this is zero. So what does that mean? It means that this integral plus this integral is zero. Now, another way of writing this second integral right here is we could spit out this minus sign. So now we're going around C2 uh, the original way, the negatively oriented way, but we need to have a negative sign. here. And then we just add this to both sides. And then we have that our C1 integral is the same as our C2 integral. 
Now, what's wrong with just doing our C1 integral right here? We have to use this parameterization, which sucks. But with C2, we could use this parameterization, which actually won't be that bad. Let's go ahead and see what this actually turns into. So I can't write squiggles anymore. Um, let's see here. So since I'm going around a full circle right here, um, we're going to go from zero to two pi. Yeah, Ryan, that's exactly what's going on here. Um, yeah, so we're, we're kind of doing this in reverse. So we, we see, use Greenstone to realize the sum of these two is zero. And then if we figure out what this is right here, we automatically know what this is. And that's the goal. All right. So let's go ahead and plug in our parameterization here. So we have negative y. So that's going to be negative a sine of t. And then I divide by x squared plus y squared. So that's a squared cosine squared of t plus a squared sine squared of t. All right. And then I multiply by dx. Now dx is going to be negative a sine of t dt if I do the derivative of this right here. So I'm effectively just gonna multiply by another one of these. Okay, that's the first part, that's the dx part. And then the next part we have x, a cosine of t. Again, on the bottom, we have a squared cosine squared plus a squared sine squared. I think you guys know what that's gonna happen or what's gonna happen there. And then dy, is the derivative of this right here. So that's a cosine t. And then this is dt as well. All right, so when we smash all of this together, they have the same denominator. Um, well, actually, what does the denominator simplify to? What are both of these denominators just going to end up being? a squared, that's right. So we do zero to two pi, a squared, and then what do we have on top? Well, we have negative a sine, negative a sine, that's a squared sine squared. And then we have a cosine, a cosine. And we have the same thing. So we have a squared on the top and bottom. So this ended up boiling down to just doing the integral of one or just the integral of dt. And we end up with two pi is our answer here. So that was a lot of work. So, so unlike the previous problem where we could just conclude at zero, having this little annoying point here that's undefined made this whole integral ended up being two pi right here. Now that seems like a lot of work and that was a lot of kind of mental gymnastics, a lot of reasoning here. Um, but there's one really interesting result that we can get from this. When did we use the fact that this was x to the two thirds plus y to the two thirds is one? Do we ever use that information at all? Yeah, we never use that. So rather than drawing this, I could have drawn some insane squiggly looking thing like that. And the problem would have went exactly the same way. So as long as you would have had any closed curve containing the origin, the integral around any of them would be two pi for this. So that's kind of interesting here. It doesn't matter what shape it is. So we did a lot of work, but we actually got handsomely rewarded. We now know the integral of any closed curve containing the origin of this. All right, so we did that. That, that was the tricky part here. That was, that was the hard part today. We made it through the hard part. All right. Now, in addition to going the way where we have a line integral and then we make it into a double integral, which is easier, we can also start with a double integral and then make it into a line integral that's easier. So this ends up going both ways right here. All right, so let's see here. Let's try to turn this double integral into a nicer line integral right here. Um, so we're trying to do the double integral of y squared dA, where d is the region enclosed by this ellipse right here. Now, I guess we can maybe use a Jacobian to make this a unit circle and then um, use polar coordinates, but let's try to use Green's theorem for this. So what we're saying, is that we have the double integral of y squared dA, right? Now, the thing with Green's theorem is that the inside of our double integral was always qx minus py. So that means we want our qx minus py to be y squared. Now, there actually is a lot of different ways of having this happen. I'm probably just gonna do the simplest way. I'm gonna have my P be zero 
and my Q be X, Y squared. So that way, P sub Y will be zero and Q sub X will be Y squared. And then we have Y squared minus zero is Y squared. So what that means is this is now going to turn into the line integral around the boundary here. Um, we have the line integral around the boundary and then we're going to do P dx is so zero dx plus Q dy right here. All right, now we need to, all we need to do is just do this line integral right now. So all we need to do is parameterize the ellipse. So I think we've seen how to do that before. X will be three cosine of T right here. And then Y will be two sine of t right here. All right, so if we wanna go all the way around the ellipse, we're gonna go from zero to two pi. X is equal to three cosine of t. Y squared will be four sine squared of t. And then dy, so if I do the derivative of this, I have two cosine of t dt. All right. So what do we got going on here? Oh yeah, yeah, sorry. So I should have mentioned orientation. Uh, so we need to make sure that our parameterization orients this positively, but going around the ellipse counterclockwise will orient this positively. But yeah, that's a little detail um, that we should focus on here. All right, I'm gonna multiply all of this two times four times three is 24. And then we have sine squared, cosine squared. All righty. Um, let's see, how are we doing on time? Here? Where are we time? Okay. Um, let's see here. I'm going to explain how to do this integral, and then I'm just going to leave it for you guys because this is this is going back to count two. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to spit out a four here. Now, why did I do that? What's going on with this? Well, this in here is the same thing as two sine of T cosine of T squared. And what this is going to be is sine of two T. So another way of writing this is six times the integral from zero to two pi of sine squared of 2t dt. And then at this point to finish things off, we would use the half angle with sine squared and then, and then we just integrate cosine there. All right, now using this idea, kind of making our own vector field that worked with our double integral, this is going to help us with the next problem right here. All right, so we're gonna be able to use Green's theorem to calculate area. So if D is a plane curve bounded by a piecewise, smooth, simple, closed curve C oriented counterclockwise, then the area of the region bounded by that curve is one of these integrals here. And there are actually a bunch more, but these are probably the most common ones. Our area is the line integral of X dy or negative the line integral of Y dx or the average of the two, one half X dy minus Y dx. Okay, now why does that work? Why, why can't we just get area from those right here? Um, well, the area of a region is the double integral of one, right? So kind of like in the last problem where we had to recreate y squared using qx minus py, and we're now gonna recreate one using qx minus py. So we're gonna write this as a qx minus py. Oh yeah, I guess they said it right here. All right. So what we need to do is we need to select a Q and a P such that this will work. And there are a few different vector fields that will do this. For example, this one having P be zero and Q being X, that will work for this. Uh, we could also have X being negative Y and Q being zero, that will work. And we could have half of each and that will work too. Honestly, I just use either of these two. I don't. There might be some really specific scenario where this is better, but I haven't seen one yet. Okay, so what are we going to do here? 
So we're going to use Green's theorem to calculate the area enclosed by the x-axis and one arc of the cycloid, x is a t minus sine of t, y is a times one minus cosine of t right here. So the cycloid is the thing that kind of looks like this. If you attach a, um, a little dot to a wheel of a bicycle and you measure how high that is as the bicycle wheel moves along, it would make this graph right here. That's what a cycloid is. All right. So how are we supposed to find the area of this? Uh, for this one, I'm going to use the formula negative y dx right here. Um, it's not too bad to use x dy, but I think this one's a little better. So we have negative, and we know this is going to be from 0 to 2 pi, because they tell us that. And then we have y, which is a times 1 minus cosine of t. And then we have the derivative of x, which is also a times 1 minus cosine of t. All right. So let's see here. Um, so we can move the a squared out of this. And then if we FOIL this out, we have one minus two cosine of T plus uh, cosine squared of T, dt. Why, why? Because I'm using this formula for uh, area right here. So remember on the previous page, we said that the area could be negative the integral of y dx right here. So that's where that's coming from. All right, so we need to do this now. So let's see. Um, so if I use the half angle on this, I'm going to get one half plus one half cosine of two t. So when I combine that here, I have three abs minus two cosine of t uh, plus one half cosine of two t right here. Is there any reason why I didn't do the x dy one? Uh, that one ended up being a bit harder to do. Um, and then we go ahead and do this integral here. Okay, so we have negative a squared, and then this is gonna be three halves t minus two sine of t plus one fourth sine of two t. This all goes from zero to two pi right here. All right, so we go ahead and plug two pi in. And we end up getting um, negative three a squared pi. And then we have minus two sine of two pi, which is zero. We have one quarter sine of two of four pi, which is zero. And then we have zero, zero, and zero. So we end up getting this right here. Um, why is y used twice? Because the derivative of x ends up being y right here. So we have the derivative of this ends up being one minus cosine of t right here. Although now I'm looking at this, why is this negative? Did I drop some sign, some sort of sign somewhere? Hmm. Ugh, no matter how far you go in math, there's, there's no way to avoid sign here. Like they just, they're, they're a constant plague. Let's see. Um, hmm. Yeah, I'm not really seeing where that um, the negative came from. Oh, it was negatively oriented. That's right. Yeah, so if we go from zero to two pi, thank you for paying attention to that, yeah. So if we go from zero to two pi, remember this is the area that we're trying to find. We're trying to find the area right here underneath one arch. So if we follow it from zero to two pi, we're going to end up with a negatively oriented um, thing, but we really want a positively oriented thing. So I technically should have done this integral from two pi to zero because then that way we're going this way and we have a positively oriented 
curve. Yeah, thank you for catching that. I knew it was something to do with that. Okay, and that's a plus, and then this is a plus right here. I'm confused. So if we go from zero to two pi and we follow along the cycloid that way, let me draw another picture. So here's one arch of the cycloid. We want to find the area underneath it. So this is our area D. So what we're doing, if we follow along the path of the cycloid from zero to two pi, our curve is oriented that way right here. So if we look to the right, we see our area, but that means that we're negatively oriented. So really, we don't wanna go this way. We wanna follow along the cycloid starting from here and ending here. So we should go from two pi to zero for this one right here. All right, yeah, and I think there's some confusion about this. These look the same. Um, yeah, coincidentally, X, um, dx is equal to y for this problem. It's not always going to be multiplying the same thing with the other. All right, so that is it for today. Um, I recommend, uh, this is definitely a lecture I'd recommend maybe uh, watching the recording or at least skimming it, especially over the part where we did this, um, uh, this argument here. I would really pay attention to this because this is probably the most detailed uh, thing right here. Um, so I, I would pay attention to this part right here. Uh, but anyways, I will see you guys next time where we will begin laying some groundwork for um, some more versions of the fundamental theorem of